Have you ever heard it? Somebody you care about says, I hate you. Have you ever said it? Somebody that you care about that you actually, in a fit of anger at some point, frustration, whatever, said to them, I hate you. It gets used a lot. And the word hate can mean different things in different contexts. It can actually actually mean in some contexts a mild dislike, like I hate broccoli. And in some contexts, it's extremely intense because it's considering an emotion that can rage, can almost become violent. And there's a whole lot of things in between. So what is hate? And particularly, what about it when one spouse, maybe both, one spouse says it to the other or they both say it to each other? What does that mean, and how in the world can you deal with it? Well, let's talk about that. I'm Dr. Joe Beam with Marriage Helper. This is Kimberly Holmes, our CEO, and uh, has part of your research for your PhD, I know you're getting close to the end, had involved anything about hate? No, quite opposite types of emotions <laughs> with self-esteem and goal attainment and more of well-being, the well-being aspect of a person. No, not hate. So in reading about hate, which I've done, yeah. um, the person that I think has the best insight into it is Dr. Robert Sternberg. Mm-hmm. Now, Sternberg and I are the same age, but he's far more accomplished than I in so many ways. The last time I looked was in 2015, so that's been quite a while ago. And he already had like just shy of 1,600 scholarly articles published in scholarly journals, peer-reviewed scholarly journals, plus his books. The man's brilliant. Very brilliant. However, you have also helped save well thousands of marriages. So I don't know that you can compare the accomplishments know, I, of the two I'm of I'm just you. telling you the man is a brilliant man. Very brilliant researcher, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so some of his research about love that we picked up on a long time ago, years ago, we think is the best stuff on love out there because it makes it so much easier to understand and to know what to do about love. Well, he's also studied hate. And he says, hate is not the opposite of love. Now, that might sound surprising to you because people say this, but he says, no, no, no. Hate is not the opposite of love. Hate actually is something parallel to love in the sense that the same things that will lead you to want to be closer to another person and have positive emotions about them in a different context or done in a different way would be the reasons that you don't want to be around them. And so it could be a mild form of that where you don't feel love or hate. Just say, I'm just done with you. I don't even think about you anymore. But just like if you went in one direction, it increases the positive emotion, which becomes love. If you go in the other direction, it increases the negative emotion, which becomes hate. Now, we don't have time in this podcast to go through all that. As a matter of fact, we have a toolkit about hate, do we not? We absolutely do. Why does my spouse hate me? And... We've spent a lot of time in there talking about Sternberg research, the eight different kinds of hate, yeah. and all those kinds of things, and, and we can refer you to that. But for right now, let's just say it this way. There are various kinds of hate. Some he would call a cool hate. Some he would call a hot hate, etc. And basically what it boils down to is, is when you have hurt me in an area that's very important to me and that is evoking very negative emotions toward you. Now, Kimberly Sternberg would say that happens in in a lot of areas, but the three we look at would be intimacy, meaning openness, transparency, vulnerability, passion, and commitment. Mm. So how could one violate the commitment that the other person expects, which would create or evoke those negative emotions? There's maybe one of the best ways to think about it is thinking of commitment as a, a spectrum, not that there's... I'll explain what I mean and maybe we can think of a different word, but there are the things that are smaller that you expect your spouse to do because you have entered into a committed relationship with them and you just have expectations, not just for them to stay monogamous per se, but expectations of we are going to share the workload of the house, the disciplining and upbringing of the children, all of those things. And so when trust begins to be broken in even the smaller things such as that, then it can begin to erode a commitment. But then, of course, there's if we go to the other end of the spectrum, the much larger issues such as we committed that we were going to be monogamous and now we're not. Or mm-hmm. we committed that we, um, whether it was spoken or unspoken, we committed that we were going to share a similar faith and now you don't. We committed we were going to live a certain way, share a certain set of morals and behaviors, and now you have changed. And so that's where deeper infractions of the break the 
the brokenness of the commitment and the infractions of trust can come. Okay, so let's think about commitment in this way then. That's very good. It's uh, doing whatever it takes to keep mm-hmm. the relationship alive. Mm-hmm. And so commitment is, this is the pledge I've made because I know this is important to you to continue our relationship. Yeah. And I think your idea of a spectrum actually makes sense. And so uh, let's say it's a, a wife who's kind of insecure about herself and she sees her husband at a party talking to another woman. She might see that as a violation of commitment. You're supposed to be committed to me, but she might not see it as being massive, mm-hmm. enough that it hurts her, but not enough to make her end the relationship. Mm-hmm. Where on the other end of it, if, if she comes back home early from work and finds her spouse in bed with another woman, that would be like a major violation right. of the commitment. Right. So it is time to trust. So commitment is what does the other person actually expect of me? And if I am fulfilling that or not fulfilling that, and so if my spouse says he or she hates me, in the last solo spouse workshop I did, uh, we had a guy there who said, I'm the spouse that's straight. Uh, I had the affair. He was very open. He was very transparent. He was very penitent, very Mm -hmm. sorry about what he had done. And he said, but my wife now hates me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's the kind of hate that comes from, I had myself committed to you, you committed to me, and then you violated that commitment. And so it can come from that. Mm -hmm. Passion, that's the kind of hate that can ebb and uh, can come and go fastest. Why is that? Well, passion is... And the positive side of things, passion is one of the quickest to come and quickest to go because it really is more of, I mean, passion in a good relationship is, oh, I want to be with you. I want to be intimate with you. I want to do some of these, you know, more sexual things with you. That's the premise of passion, which some days you feel and some days you some minutes you feel and, you know, some minutes you don't. So it can ebb and flow on the positive side quicker. And so on the flip side, when it's the I guess the the hatred part of passion, we can understand why it would ebb and flow as well. You really pissed me off just mm-hmm. now. Like I am really angry at you about that. And if you define passion as a craving for oneness. Yeah. So then when someone does something that you don't like and you don't want to be around them because they're being a jerk right now or because they said, you know, you can't believe that they said that or they didn't do what they said they were going to do. You don't want to be around that person in the moment. So it's no longer a craving for oneness. And therefore, there's a lapse in passion. And that's why Sternberg would call that a hot hate. Mm. But it can change rapidly. I remember being in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting a few years ago where woman, a woman who was going through the 12 steps of, of AA one of the steps is to go and make, uh, try to make things right with people, you know, that you mm-hmm. have. So she goes to this woman and says, I just need you to know that uh, one night at a party, I had sex with your husband. Now, first of all, that should have never happened. That was the husband's responsibility to tell, not her. Mm-hmm. Of course, the wife instantly is furious. I mean, like to the point of let's shred his clothes. Let's throw his stuff out in the yard. Let's, yeah. let's do all these things. And then finally, the woman who was in AA, she, as she tells the story, she said, and then finally I realized, oh, no, it wasn't that guy. It was oh, another guy. No. Mm-hmm. He had never slept with that woman's husband. What a terrible mm-hmm. mistake. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so when she comes back and tells the woman, I, I was really drunk that night. I finally realized it was this guy, not that guy. I've never, ever been with your husband. Now, of course, it took a little time for her to decide if she were going to believe that, meaning the wife. Like, right. how did that story change? But when she did, her emotions changed dramatically. Yeah. And if the woman had said, as a matter of fact, I hit on your husband that night, and he said, no, honey, I'm happily married, mm-hmm. the emotions would have become even more positive. Yeah. And so those things can move the fastest. Mm-hmm. For sure. And the big one is? Intimacy. Mm-hmm. So that's the third one. So intimacy in the triangulation of love is the 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 friendship aspect of it. It's we are connected. We're transparent and vulnerable and honest with each other. It's the that deep connection that you have with the person. So then in the does he call it the triangulation of hate? Yeah. The tri- yeah, so mm-hmm. then in the triangulation of hate, the intimacy is where that person has now become an enemy. Not only are you not close and not transparent, but you truly feel like this person is against you. But what they do brings Negative emotions. Right. So, for example, if you had a best friend mm-hmm. and and you became very transparent with each other and your friend would talk about his or her things they've done idiotically over life, everybody has some. Mm-hmm. Maybe you have done the same. You have shared 
deep, intimate details about men. I messed up that time I did that over there. And if somewhere along the line, that friend, the person, whoever he or she may be, could be your spouse, but that person that you've trusted with all these intimate details about you starts using them against you. I actually had a young man I tried to mentor a few years ago. And as mentoring him, sometimes I would talk about my weaknesses to help him talk about his. And then suddenly, at least it appeared suddenly to me, one day he decided he wanted to go a different direction. And the next thing I know, he's sending people emails saying, did you know that Joe once did this, Joe once did that, Joe just once did the other. And of course, instantly, trust is obliterated. Absolutely. But not only that, the sharing positive emotions increase feelings of love. I want to be closer to you. And, and those evoked strong negative emotions. Another guy, as you know, I actually helped him uh, get out of jail by giving mm-hmm. him a job, got him out on probation. And, and he stole $7,000 from me before I could catch him. Just so people know, this was decades ago. And decades this person ago. does not work at Marriage Helper decades currently. Decades <laughs> ago. Decades ago. And then he went back to prison uh, mm-hmm. because I had to tell the probation officer that was part of the deal. So they put him back in prison for a while, and they got out, and he called me and said, okay, let's go, go do great things together. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, <laughs> no, I don't hate you in the sense that I've got all these strong negative emotions about you, but I don't have any positive emotions towards you either. Right. And so what if you're trying to redevelop intimacy? You see, you wouldn't start with commitment. Well, actually, in a sense, you would. So let's talk about the guy that was in the solo spouse workshop recently. He could make a commitment to his wife, whether you believe it or not, whether it even matters to you or not, but I'm committed. I'm never going to be unfaithful to you again, even if you're divorcing. He could do that. So you can start with a commitment there, but the other person's not going to believe it. Right. So what you have to do is start with intimacy. So how would you rebuild intimacy to get past eight? Yeah. Well, what were the things that broke intimacy? It was the things that broke trust, the things that... Um, evoked emotions within the other person that they did not enjoy feeling. So in order to rebuild the trust and rebuild intimacy, you begin by doing the things that will evoke emotions that the person enjoys feeling. And this is actually the third step in our process of rescuing a marriage. Mm -hmm. Step one is to calm down. Step two is to get clarity. But then step three is to stop your pushes and start your pulls. And whether your spouse hates you or not, it's the place to start to bring a marriage back together uh, and make it better than it ever was before. So that's where we start identifying what were the things that I've done that's pushed them away how can I then replace those with things I can do to begin to pull them back? Mm-hmm. And a couple of things about that, that that are really important. Number one is extreme patience. Mm. Because just because you want the other person to, to forgive you, let's get past it, let's move mm-hmm. on, doesn't mean it's going to happen. Right. Even if they say, I forgive you. It doesn't mean all those emotions have changed at that point. Yeah. And so we point out to people, as you really develop intimacy, which is the way to get past hate, it's going to take a while, and you have to be patient, and you cannot force it. Mm-hmm. Like the man I talked about, about a minute ago who decades ago stole money from me, he said, well, because you're a Christian, you have to do this. Well, I am a Christian, <laughs> but I don't have to do that, and you're not going to guilt me into trusting you again. That's not going to work. Even more of a red flag. <laughs> exactly, but more negative emotions. And so if, if my spouse says I hate, uh, if my spouse says to me, I hate you, Does that mean they'll hate me for the rest of their lives? Possibly, but not probably. Because what they hate is what you did that evoked those negative emotions. You can't make those disappear. You can't find a time machine and go back on the other side of that and do it differently. The only thing you can do is live consistently enough, understanding that no human being is 100% consistent, that you live consistently enough and patiently enough doing the things to redevelop intimacy, not trying to push it on the other, not trying to force it on the other, and hope that with time, they begin to see the difference. So Kimberly, there's a, a guy who was a very good friend of mine when I was 19 years old, which was like 300 years ago. <laughs> We were very close at a lot of things together. And then over the years, he got out with me because we believed things differently. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, and I actually have, or I don't have them now, people would send me recordings where he would speak to big audiences, call my name, and, and tell them how bad I was because I believed this and that and the other. Wow. I mean, I mean, totally at me. We're buddies again. Hmm. What I'm saying is, it, it's not going to be there forever. People 
or probably not going to be there forever. People change. Mm -hmm. And so you just need to make sure that you keep changing for the better. Mm -hmm. And as that happens, and as we maturate, as we get older and wiser, we begin to see things a little bit differently. Now, I'm not saying that if your spouse waits, hates you when you're 25, you're going to be 65 before it starts turning the other way. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that it absolutely will change because if your spouse wants to hang on to the hate, they can, which will make a very miserable lifestyle for them. But we're saying, can you get past it? Absolutely. But you have to work on you patiently, slowly, without pushing. So what I hear you saying is that it's actually better that their spouse is saying that they hate them as opposed to their spouse saying that they feel nothing towards them. In a sense, that's right. We have witnessed that so many times. The spouse who has completely become unemotional about you is hard to re-evoke those positive emotions. Now, it can be done. We help people do it all the time, but it's much more difficult. Yeah. Because if they're feeling emotions yeah. like hate, it's actually not as difficult to, to change the emotion as it is to change the apathy into a positive emotion. Yeah. Absolutely. And this is one of those topics that one of our core values at Marriage Helper is unshakable truth. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely parts of this that some of our listeners probably didn't want to hear, such as possibly, but not probably. But right? We tell the truth. We have to tell the truth. But if you're listening to this and you're feeling frustrated, like, well, ah, like this is where my marriage is stuck and I am struggling with patience and what to do moving forward. That's exactly why we have the Save My Marriage membership, where inside of it, not only can you go through the entire Why Does My Spouse Hate Me toolkit, but then you can also go in and begin understanding the things that you can begin to do to have the best opportunities and chances to turn that hate around and bring love back into your marriage instead. And as a listener of the podcast, you can receive 25% off your first month of the Save My Marriage membership by going to marriagehelper.com slash podcast. Again, that is marriagehelper.com slash podcast. And I don't even think you need a coupon. You just go straight in and the offer of 25% off the first month is there for you. And does it really help people change their marriages? Absolutely. Well, we actually have oh, a, a story. A I, story. That's what that is. If yes. I had my glasses, I would know that. <laughs> Don't have my glasses on. We we received a, a testimonial, a story of hope, as we like to call them. This is what the person said. I'm so entirely thankful that God led me to Marriage Helper. I prayed so much for help in this season, and I just kept seeing Marriage Helper over and over and over again in all of my searches, both on Google and YouTube. So after a massive blowout fight two months after D-Day, the day everything kind of blew up, which resulted in me losing my voice, which means it must have been quite oh, wow. the blowout, yeah. I finally joined Marriage Helper. I only wish that I had joined sooner. So thank you, Marriage Helper. I sincerely feel happier as a person because I have been such an emotionally driven person my entire life, and your practices have really made me step out of my comfort zone and cause me to not be so reactive to every little thing. I truly feel like I am growing as a person. I have always had faith in God, and I am so grateful your practices have taught me to realign myself with not relying on my own understanding and also not to believe my feelings." I heard from my husband today for the first time in weeks. He's almost two weeks late in paying me an agreed bi-monthly amount. Mm. There have been a lot of extenuating circumstances as to why he couldn't, but nonetheless, I could have chosen to be frustrated that he took me off the access from the bank account without warning me three months ago. Mm. But I chose to accept that he did it and thanked him when he sent me the money today. I never mentioned anything about him being late about it, not even once. Nor did I belittle him or harass him for being late on his payment. I have found that acceptance really is huge. Powerful. I believe my interaction today just put me one step closer to our reconciliation. I am proud of myself today. <laughs> I am thankful that God has given me so much peace in the hardest season I've ever had in my life. And I'm thankful for Marriage Helper for instilling such important values that I will carry the rest of my life one day closer. I love that she said, I, yeah, she, I love that she said, I'm proud of myself today. And in a lot of the research I have been doing, people don't take the time mm. to sit in the good things that happen. Yeah. They tend to just ruminate about the negative right. and it 
<laughs> it's part of a much deeper training on habit loops and like how our brain forms processes and thought processes. But like the fact that she said, I'm so proud of myself today. I think everyone should do that. Yeah. Like find something every day. Good deal. That was good. And it really feels good when somebody else pats you on the back as well because they see it. So okay. this is what you'd recommend right now. They, they uh, join in the sense you just talked about a good first step of being involved with Mary Chopper. Absolutely. If you would like to experience some amazing turnarounds and wins, such as this story of hope that we just read, then again, I encourage you to join the Save My Marriage membership, 25% off your first month as a listener by going to marriagehelper.com slash podcast. Until next week, remember, there is always hope.